Okay, good afternoon. We're back. Uh, we're back this afternoon, the Department of Corrections with the commissioner uh, to really speak more of an update in terms of what the department has been doing under the issue of COVID, which really began last spring in basically the first part of March. And the committee just wanted some um, information over what's occurred over the past year and also where we are now in terms of uh, this DOC COVID response is how we titled it. So welcome, Commissioner. And you've Thank brought- you, Madam, some, Madam Chair. And you've brought some folks with you. I brought some guests with me. Okay. And, uh, so for the record, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Jim Baker, the Interim Commissioner of Corrections. And uh, uh, with me today is Deputy Commissioner uh, Judy Henkin. I asked the Deputy Commissioner to come with me because um, she has the point um, on the medical process inside the department. But for this conversation, she's the point on um, vaccination. And I'll touch on that in a little bit, um, you know, where we are with that. and. Um, um, the deputy commissioners with me to um, address that. Um, normally, I would bring Chief Cormier with me, but uh, he's uh, he's at a a, a a legal proceeding today, tied up for the day. Um, I, I will tell you, he's been the incident commander um, running the operation that we've been running nonstop for the last year. I'll get into a few details about that, and uh, I also have with me today uh, Sarah Turcott. Um, Sarah is one of our recruiters. She's involved in the hiring process and she's been key in um, uh, redesigning our hiring process. And uh, that's not the reason why I brought her. Um, she's also involved in the logistical support um, for the operation that we run continuously, um, supplying our facilities with PPE, cleaning supplies, and so on. And uh, I brought Sarah along with me but I also want to emphasize that um, this is what we've been doing for the last year, nonstop. Everybody's got two and three jobs now. Uh, nobody's got a single job any longer uh, with COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 kind of, it's our, our focus every day, but we still are trying to move forward in other areas as well. And everybody's doing two and three jobs. And Sarah is an example of that. And um, she'll be able to talk to you a little bit about how we're handling the logistics. And I, I've kind of kidded with this committee and other committees before, but um, I would put the work that Sarah is doing with um, her teammates in the logistics section of this operation up against Walmart any day of the week. And I think uh, you will hear her talk about how we have production supplies coming in. We have our own transportation system to move supplies out to the facilities. Um, we're self-contained, not depending on anyone. And I brought Sarah along to talk about that today. Madam Chair, I think the place to start is just, especially for the newer committee members, let me just take them back to February of 2020. And, um, you know, we started very early on as we started hearing from our colleagues around the country about what was then um, not even the virus hitting the shores of America. We started a very immature, underdeveloped, unsophisticated, screening process for people coming into our system. It was uh, as simple as, hey, have you, have you traveled to uh, the Far East? Have you been in China? Um, that's where we started this operation um, back in February when we first started hearing about what was happening. And we started hearing from some of our colleagues around the country about what the concerns were for the jail system. And then we moved to, to an early screening process for our employees, um, and for people coming into our system. And then we started thinking about logistics and supplies and we started building up our supplies. For example, our food supplies, our water supplies, our cleaning supplies. We started building those up uh, at the end of February, moving into March in what I would describe at the time to be a very unsophisticated process. We were just starting to get as many supplies in as we could because we started hearing that um, this could get real serious. And so, that was kind of the early stages of logistics and supplies. Um, just like you all left the, the state house on March 13th, I believe it was, Madam Chair, you said? It, it was a Friday, the 13th. Never, never looked back. Um, <laughs> I left Waterbury uh, the week before. 
And I have not been back since. So, you know, we're all in this environment where, and I, and I only say that because the, the, the operation I'm gonna to describe to you in a few minutes, we've, we've been running remotely um, for over a year. Um, Chief Cormier hasn't been to Waterbury. Uh, he's kind of in the same boat I am sitting in a kind of a high risk area. Um, very few folks go into the Waterbury office. We run this completely remotely doing the same things you're all doing over, except we don't use Zoom, we use Teams um, to, to run the operations. I just wanna, before I start describing this in detail, I, I wanna emphasize something. I, uh, many of you know my background. Um, some, of, some of the new committee members heard my background when we first got introduced. This is by far, without question, I was not directly involved uh, in Irene as a state employee but I was involved in Irene as, as uh, doing some consulting work for towns, um, preparing for it. This is my experience as the largest operation I've ever seen. Now you wouldn't know this is going on every day because we just, it, it goes so smoothly and we do it as a course of business every day that you wouldn't realize the amount of effort that goes into this every single day. And I must, I must tell you, I, I, I had a conversation with the chair earlier and forwarded to the chair and the vice chair uh, a press, press release. We do have three positive inmates at Chittenden um, currently, and uh, we, we, uh, we have done contact tracing, and we have 18 staff members quarantined as a result of contact tracing. And I tell you that in the context of what I'm gonna to describe to you as we walk through what's going on. Um, this week alone, this week alone, we're conducting almost a thousand tests within our system. We're doing a thousand tests. Our strategy is test to suppress. And so every two weeks, we test employees, including employees inside the facilities. And we just started testing about a month and a half ago, five weeks ago, our, our employees in our probation and paroles offices. So every two weeks, our employees are being tested. We know now at the point where we are in the virus that the, our, our threat of coming into the facility is gonna come from the outside. And so we have focused our efforts on testing staff um, every two weeks. We test every facility every six weeks, except when we have a positive test or contact tracing, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So to date, um, we've tested um, 2,433 individuals. Now, again, um, some of those could be twice we've tested 2,400 plus individuals. And we've conducted um, 11,920 tests in our, in our system. And this is as of two days ago. I'm not counting the tests that have gone on the last two days. And out of that, we've had 141 positives uh, and 11,647 negatives. Um, we, as I said, we currently have um, we currently have staff, six staff positive in Chitton, three uh, 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 inmates that are positive who are now in isolation away from the rest of the population. So this is what the process looks like. We meet every, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning at nine o'clock as, as a command team. We've had an incident command system up and running for a year. Uh, Chief Cormier is the incident commander we have, we have a logistics sections, an operations section, and a, uh, a medical section. And so every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we meet to process what's going on. It used to be in the beginning that we met every, every Monday through Friday at nine o'clock and three times a week at noontime. But we've geared that back because we feel like the system is working. And when something does happen, um, our folks are, uh, they know what to do. They know how to react. Um, as I said, our strategy is to test the suppress, and um, we ha we have we are part of the health department's rapid response team. So if we get a positive test, either of a staff or an inmate, the rapid response team responds immediately with contact tracers and help from the health department. And we start contact tracing to determine who's been in contact, and then we make determinations from there about what the testing all look like. And as I said, this week alone, we're doing about a thousand tests. 
Um, when folks enter our system, anybody that comes into our system new is tested and quarantined. So if somebody's arrested by an agency and they come in, or when we're bringing uh, uh, inmates back from Mississippi, they're quarantined for 14 days and tested. They're tested, uh, they're tested on day zero, day seven and day 12. Um, that's part of our protocol and guidance from CDC. Mm -hmm. Our protocol is reviewed um, almost daily. Not like it was four or five months ago, but four or five months ago, it wouldn't be unusual for us to be changing protocol every single day as a result of guidance from the Vermont Department of Health and from the CDC. That's slowed down a little bit because the guidance has become really mature at the federal level. And our relationship with the health department here in Vermont is, um, is so in sync that we don't have to make a lot of adjustments to our, our protocol like we were early in the beginning. So if we get a positive test uh, of an inmate or a staff member, that rapid response team responds immediately and we have trained contact tracers inside our department. We do all our own contact tracing in conjunction with the health department. We don't depend on anybody else. And we have several people um, that have really developed an expertise uh, when it comes to contact tracing. And we'll, we'll figure out as a result of that contact tracing, meet with the rapid response team and determine what the next steps are. So let me give you the last week for an example of what could happen. We had a, we had a, a medical person that, that was going from the Chittenden facility to Northwest who, who uh, tested positive. So we know that that individual was in Northwest with certain inmates, but was based out of Chittenden. The rapid response team did contact tracing. And in the case of Northwest, they determined that the contact was so minimal that we only had to do a certain amount of isolating or quarantining of inmates in that facility, but we didn't have to lock the facility down. And we determined that we didn't have to do testing until it was time for that testing to occur. But back at Chittenden, because of the contact and the number of positives, we immediately started retesting the facility. And that's how we caught the three um, inmates that are positive. And just like last spring, April, when we had, the, we had an outbreak in Northwest, that contact tracing shut it down in its tracks. We were able to quickly isolate it, um, get people separated out and prevent the spread going through the jail like you see in other parts of the country. Now I'm gonna say this, and I know some of this is, is pure luck, but we are the only state in the country right now that has not had a death of an inmate. In our We're the only state in the country that's done that. And again, some of that is simply because, you know, Vermont has done an incredible job for, on community spread. And right now we know in our system, our threat to our facilities is based on community spread. So part of the process that we do every day is we take a look at community spread based on what we're hearing from the health department. And we have, we do use a tool that was developed by the, uh, by the National Governors Association in, in, in uh, I, I'm forgetting the name of the nonprofit that developed it, but it's a predictive modeling tool. We do utilize that tool and it's been very, very accurate for us. So, <clears throat> Almost to the point of, if I'm not mistaken, last week the tool predicted that we would have um, a couple, three inmates positive at Chittenden, and that's what it was. So we're being, unlike us being totally reactive before, we are sort of reactive now, but we are thinking forward all the time, every day, about potentially what we're seeing on the horizon, including the community spread and what that tool may be telling us. We know that we need to be paying attention to Chittenden. And we need to be ready to react quickly if something outbreaks, if we have an out outbreak or positive test, that we quickly can move the rapid response team in that process. Um, let me just talk about staff a little bit uh, in this process. We've been through several renditions of, we've, we've rented hotel rooms for staff when we've had outbreaks. Um, you know, at one point, um, as Representative Campbell knows, we set up a triage unit, a surge unit up in St. Johnsbury. We've changed that protocol. I'm not saying we won't ever go back 
I'm hoping we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel here. It's been a long year for everybody, especially the staff in corrections. I'm hoping we're seeing the end of this and we don't have to worry about a surge unit. Because the other thing for the new committee members that I talked last year about, you know, when we start getting positive tests, we have to think about what is the capacity of ourselves to handle our medical needs internally and what will be the impact on the external medical system outside of the jails. That's why it's so important for us to be preventive. So uh, Madam Chair, I'll think about Springfield for a minute. If we had a major outbreak in the Springfield facility, it would not take much to overwhelm your hospital in Springfield. So we are very conscious of that and work with the external partners all the time. But that's why we are so focused on trying to keep the virus contained inside our facilities so it doesn't impact the care of folks on the outside. And we, you know, again, much, much of this is luck and we understand that, but much of it is because of how hard the staff is working. We, we, have, uh, we have really pushed the staff in the last year. And we still struggle with our vacancies. And um, you know, when you have 18 staff out quarantined in one facility, in this case, it's, it's six medical staff from our contractor, but 12 of our staff are, are quarantined. Um, and that puts a lot of stress, puts a lot of stress on the facility and the staff. And um, they've done an unbelievable job. Um, you know, I, I come here today as the commissioner telling you um, the successes we've had, but it's not me doing it, it's the staff. It's been an incredible effort, the constant cleaning, the constant paying attention to protocols. And we recently added an auditing process. So we actually have a person that audits the protocols at the facilities to make sure we're not missing anything. We're not trying to get anybody catch you. We're not trying to try to play hide, hide in the bushes and see if we can catch you doing something wrong. It's really a protocol process to pay attention, audit and make sure that we're following our protocols and we're not missing anything. Let me touch on Mississippi for a minute and then I'm gonna slow the conversation down and, let, let, let um, Deputy Commissioner Henkin talk about the, uh, the vaccine plans moving forward. And then um, I, I'd like to introduce to you, uh, uh, Sarah, and have her talk about the logistics. Because I saved that because I want her to talk about it. Uh, it's some impressive work. We, have, we, have, we did have an outbreak in Mississippi at, at Tallahatchie County Correctional Facility, as you all know, uh, back at the end of July. Um, there was a fair number of individuals that were positive, and I believe the number, please don't hold me to this, but I believe the number was 185 positives. And uh, to say that was a scary time would be an understatement. And um, we're very lucky that we didn't lose anybody down there. And um, since then, the conversation um, between our staff and the staff with Core Civic, who runs the facility, and my direct conversations with the CEO, I talk to the CEO on a regular basis to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, we dodged the big bullet. They're doing testing down there and they're going to be start to vaccine, vaccinate. But I got to remind you where that facility sits in Mississippi at one point about four months ago had the highest spread of any county in the country. So that's what that's the kind of um, stuff we pay attention to on the outside because that's how it's going to get in the facility from community spread. They are, they are testing on a regular basis. And um, we also have access now to camera systems. So we can remotely see what's going on inside the jail in Tallahassee remotely from computers. And the out-of-state staff monitors that on a regular basis. So I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna slow it down right now and uh, I'll stop for a minute for questions. Um, and then, um, have Deputy Commissioner Hankin talk a little bit about what's in store for vaccinations, and then I'll introduce you to, to uh, Sarah Turner. Any questions for me, Madam Chair? Sure. So this is a great uh, summary. Thank you so much, and thank you for all the work that you've you put in, and, that. and all your staff as well for all the work. Uh, so we do have a couple questions, Kurt, and then Michelle. Uh, yes, Commissioner, you mentioned that when somebody comes in, they're immediately quarantined. So does that mean that they are in a single cell by themselves for uh, two weeks? Or what does that quarantine involve? 
That, that's that's what it is. They're quarantined in a cell by themselves for the 14 days. And, uh, Good, thank well, you. Yeah, let me touch on this, Representative Teller, because just like everything we've all faced in this in this pandemic, there are so many negative things that come out of what we're doing because you have to set the priority of keeping the facility safe. And one of the negative things that's come out of this is in these isolation situations, um, the mental well-being of the individuals come into play uh, because your point is well taken. They're put into isolation quarantine for 14 days. And um, you know we, we've had a couple incidents um, where it's, it's been challenging on self-harm. And um, we are looking right now as a result of that um, um, I've asked the team to take a look at making sure we're doing the absolute level best we can on best practices around mental well-being as we bring people into our system in quarantine. In quarantine. Okay, thanks. Uh, Michelle? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more in terms of the population in Mississippi and the protocol that they have while they still are there. I mean, I know we have a lot of safety guidelines we've put in place for our population here and not having people come in and do special activities. I mean, just a whole lot of things have changed in our system here. Are they following those guidelines in Mississippi or not? They are now. Yes, they are. And how long has that been the case? Well, that, that really came to a head as a result of the incident uh, during the summer with the outbreak in Mississippi. That was part of my conversation with the CEO and I. I think we have an understanding about what our expectations are. And have there not been, uh, uh, has, the, has the rate changed? We haven't had a, a recurrence of, of cases since that time? Right, again, part of the protocol is if you have a positive, and don't hold me to this, I think I'm gonna have this right. I always run the risk of not having Chief Cormier to straighten me out. But um, if you're positive, the norm is that you don't do a test for 90 days because of the nature of the virus you could keep testing positive. We did have one inmate that kept testing positive, but was asymptomatic. But we have had, we have, we've had no other inmates positive. Okay, thank you. You're so I also, we have another question, but I wanna interject here for a minute. So the folks down in Mississippi, the Vermont inmates, they are housed separately from the other folks in the facility? That's Is that correct. correct? They're, they're in a separate wing from the other, um, the other clients that Core Civic have, the Vermont inmates are housed separately. So I just wanted to put that out because sometimes people think they're intermingled. That's correct. Okay. Scott? Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to ask a little bit about staffing. Is this a good time or are you, are you going to get into that more? No, nope. uh, if you have a question on that, sir, by all, all means ask me. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just thinking back to um, testimony we heard from the Employees Association a couple of weeks ago and uh, talking about the retention problem that you had mentioned before. Um, uh, I believe you put it, it's not that you have a hiring problem, you have a retention problem. And so I just wanted to explore that a little bit more. Um, uh, one of the things that they talked about was feeling like their correctional officers are in an untenable position um, not knowing really whether they're there just for enforcement or whether they're also there as, as social workers. And um, that, so they, they express the need for clarity, but it's, it's, it seems like that role ought to be pretty clear that they're actually kind of both because they're, they're, they're working with people who, you know, they're going to, they're going to develop a relationship with, with, with the, with the inmates. There's just, there's no way around that. So I, I just wondered if you could talk about that for a minute. Sure. So, you know, there was a time they were called guards, right? And, and I still have to correct people once in a while when I hear them call them guards. Um, because that was the old mentality. You're there to guard somebody in jail. And it, it's, not, um, it's not, not by design that their title is corrections officer. Because it, it, is, it is a mixture, as you, as you say. And I, I don't disagree with them that there's confusion out there. And it's part of the process we're going through right now with the Moss Group to develop a new mission, vision, and value statement in order for us all to be on the same page. So I can't disagree that there's confusion. 
Um, but I think you answered your own question, sir. They are there. Security of our facilities is a priority. We can't lose control of our facilities. Somebody could get hurt very badly. Um, that happens all over the country inside systems. And to the credit of the people that are serving time in our jails and our staff, we have very few incidents of violence in our facilities. I think since I've been here, I could count them on two hands. And that's a credit to our staff and to, to the inmates serving time. But you answered your own question. It's a combination thereof. Mm -hmm. they are, we are there to, uh, our, our primary focus is to take people from being good inmates to good citizens. Well, that's, that's good to hear. But one of the things that they talked about also was training and the need for really continuous training to meet that role. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it sounded like, uh, from what I'm recalling about uh, the training protocol that, that was described earlier, um, they're, uh, I think, put in the, well, maybe you, could, maybe you could describe it. I think they were put in the facility for a week and then trained for two weeks and then back to the facility or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's accurate. So what happens is that we have a hiring process that we're in, in the process of changing and, and uh, tweaking. And so people are hired by facility and they may, they go there for a shadow week is what I think we refer to it as. Yes. And then they go to a five week academy. Now, the five week academy has been compressed as a result of COVID because um, we're better off compressing that, continuing to hire people instead of having them co-mingle for five weeks together to try to avoid the issues around COVID. Hmm. And, and <clears throat> as far as the request for more training, how does that, how does that fit into your, to the plans of the, of the agency or the department? Well, I, I guess I would have to hear what context they're talking about when it comes to more training. Um, you know, I'd, I'd have to understand what the context is. There are conversations about expanding the length of the training academy. I do not think that five weeks is enough time um, to, to, to train up people um, for the complexity of the job that they do. These are very complex jobs inside facilities. Um, you know, it may, it may seem to folks from the outside looking in, as simple as coming to work and, and you're, a, you're a corrections officer maintaining safety in a facility. It's much more complicated than that. Right. Well, I guess what I'm thinking about is, is sort of continuous training. I don't know whether there's a, some sort of a, you know, a, re, a retraining program or something like that, or, or opportunities for, for, for staff to, to, to take further, uh, further training uh, programs, you know, a few times a year or something like that. Is that, is that available or is that? There's, there, there's skill sets that are trained on every year. There's uh -huh. core, core uh, skill sets that are trained on every year de-escalation skills, self-defense skills, um, those type of things. Mm -hmm. um, I do think, I, I, again, I don't have the context of what was said, but I, I think I've said this into, in the committee before, where corrections really lacks. And again, you know, if you had all the time in the world to deal with these things, we, we would have done it by now, it is, is the investment in first line up to mid-managers in the organization. There is little to no training for those individuals. So you become a first line supervisor. Hey, congratulations, you're promoted. Tonight's your first shift tonight, go to work. And um, you know we, we have a lot of challenges around that as a result of people going from being, you and I work together, we worked the same shift for three years together, and now all of a sudden you're my supervisor. And you know we have some challenges around that. And you know, I, it, it doesn't look much different than any other organization I've seen. It's just that we need to do a better job of training and investing in those individuals. That makes sense. Is there anything that you would that you see is needed uh, to improve retention uh, among the correctional officers? Yeah, I, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if you've got a couple of days, but uh, <laughs> to to sure, we got all the time there is. <laughs> I think um, we're going to get into this maybe a little deeper as the session proceeds. I, 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 um, I'll just put it just to save time for the committee today. It, it's the vicious cycle of we're shorthanded. People are forced to work overtime. Just picture you're on a treadmill and you just keep pushing the button faster and faster and you're going nowhere. And that's the story of our, our retention. It's a burnout. 
um, people get cross and uh, maybe sometimes we don't treat people the way we should treat each other. It's a combination of, of things. And then COVID, um, so there, there's a lot to unpack there, sir. And I think maybe a, another day, Madam Chair could have me come in and I'll bring the staff in to talk about it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, sir. So we have another question, Karen? Uh, so my question is, uh, well, first, just to thank you for all the work that you and your department has been doing to address safety um, in the facilities. Like, I can't imagine that undertaking, and um, the numbers are impressive. Um, I'm always curious to hear about the flip side of things, though, because um, I think with that, of having um, that infrastructure and keeping the numbers so good, what has the impact been? Just like us in the community, mm -hmm. we're having good numbers, but it means that we're sacrificing um, a lot. What would you say the sacrifice is, um, I think twofold for staff and also for the, the inmates, um, as far as programming, access to services, that kind of stuff. If we can have it's, anything on the flip side. It's, it's all of the above, right? You, you've hit it, right? It's, um, Look, we had a, you know, part of our strategy, I didn't get into this earlier, but, you know, as we got into April and May, part of, we, we shut down everything coming into the facilities we could. That meant, uh, you, you know, our, our volunteer system to include the religious community. Um, you know, um, we, we shut down programming for a while. Um, our educational piece got shut down. And for the, for the inmates, the most impactful thing, we shut down visitation. And we didn't do that lightly because we know that, you know, no matter who you are and where you are, you've got a family somewhere. And uh, we didn't do that lightly, but we felt like we had to do it. Now we've been talking about starting it up again. And then we had the holiday spike, right? Of community spread that we've all seen. And so we're kind of just holding our breath on that. But there was a lot, there was a lot of impacts not only on our staff, which I described earlier, the fear of going home and bringing the virus home to, to their families, um, but on the families of the inmates as well, not to be able to have visitation. So we did step up um, the ability for them to have free tap. Each inmate has a tablet. They were able to do video visitation and we stepped up free phone calls for them. But again, that's not like being able to see your loved one come in and visit you. And so there was a lot of downsides to this. And we've got some of it back. Programming's back. We're doing some educational stuff remotely. But again, we are limited just like, the, you know, everything that's going on in the community, it's going on inside the facilities. And as I often say, if you take a look at Springfield Jail, it's like a city. You have medical, you have a school, um, you feed people, um, you house them. And uh, you have the same impact as a result of what we've been dealing with, with the virus. Thank you for that. It's helpful just to hear that that's also part of the daily, weekly assessment of yeah, not challenging. only what can we be doing to protect, but also mm -hmm. what can we be doing to um, expand and apply our services and programs. So, yeah, And let me just give you one other example, because I think it's important. And I want whoever's out there listening to hear this. It also affected our ability to do medical care, right? Um, a lot of times inmates need to be taken out of a facility to see a specialist, right? And um, the ability to do that, dentist, that routine kind of stuff that was done, you know, we're slowly trying to get geared back up for that. But every time we move someone from one place to another, we run the risk of bringing the virus into the facility. So we have a couple more questions. Um, we've got Michelle and then we had Sarah and then our hand went down. So I don't know if we still have Sarah or not. So, Michelle. So just a, a quick question, Commissioner Baker. You mentioned that some programs have been reinstituted and I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about that. Um, I used to work at the Community Justice Center and at the time that I left, there were no programs that had like religious services had been shut down. Uh, oh. recreational things like writing classes, art classes, those had all been shut down. And as far as I know, they hadn't been replaced with like a virtual option. So can you just say a little bit more about that? What kind of things have been introduced to fill that void? Yeah, I mean, none of, none of much of that has not start up yet, started back up yet. So 
I would have to I would have to check with staff to be exactly sure of what has and has not. So for example, the religious community coming in has not started up yet. Volunteers coming back in has not started back up yet. When I talk about programming, I'm talking about our violence programming and our sexual um, mm -hmm. our sexual abuse programming um, has started back up. And some of our educational stuff has started back up with our educational team. So um, what we've tried to do is from facility to facility, you know, prior to the colder weather, but this is also a challenge, try to up rec time, provide them with more tablet time, uh, provide them with more time out of their, out of the cells. Um, so, but again, it gets limited. If we get an outbreak, we go into a lockdown. And every time we get a lockdown, I just, you know, I just, I just think about the impact on the facility. And that's why I say to you is that we, we've come this far in this process and a lot of the credit goes to the staff, but the inmates deserve credit as well because um, being in lockdown, not lockdown, not having program, not having access to family, that wears on people. So we try to step up our mental health piece and uh, we try to give them activities to be able to, to, um, to fill their time. And, uh, you know, I personally talked to inmates that have worked like on cleaning crews um, working in our shops and um, I've authorized things like pizza parties for them to get pizza from the outside. You know, um, it's amazing how they appreciate that because again, institutionalized pizza is not like getting it at your favorite pizza shop, right? So doing little things that, that can keep up morale amongst staff and the inmate population. I wonder if you have thought about and if there's a plan to to perhaps move to the next step of of offering some of those services in a remote way, for example, 12 step programs or religious services. I mean, I know some of the volunteers that used to go into the facility and some of them are doing remote offerings in other in other places. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering, you already gave them the tablets. It feels like it might not be that hard to add that add that piece. Yeah, there, there is some technology. I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I, I will have somebody get back to you. There are some technology challenges around that. Um, our, our ability on having Wi-Fi in the facilities is very limited. Mm -hmm. So they're con the, the GTL tablets are very limited in what kind of access they can get. And the last, the last time I checked on upgrading our Wi-Fi in all six facilities, we're talking in the multi-million dollar range to be able to do that. Mm. So there are challenges around that, but I will have somebody get to you um, to give you feedback on that question because I don't have the answer right now. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And as a little follow-up to that, we did try to increase the Wi-Fi access within our facilities, <clears throat> hopefully with the CRF dollars, with the COVID dollars, but the price tag was very high. And part of the problem is because our facilities are built with concrete walls and it's hard to get Wi-Fi through concrete walls. The other thing, they're not getting tablets like we are where you can access the internet. You got some real security issues that you have to, that DOC really has to look at. So there isn't always that access to um, the internet and the outside like we have, because you're in a secure setting. And you don't want um, possibly an inmate to have access to their victim or vice versa in some ways. So you, got, you have to be very, you have to be very, very careful in corrections. So Sarah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good, good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, How are you? Good, good. How are you? It's great to good to see you. Um, it's good to be you. seen at my age, representative. <laughs> and and thank you for your work. I the earlier you mentioned that Vermont is the only state in the country that hasn't had a COVID death, and I I did not know that, so um, I'm happy to hear that. But uh, one of the questions, something that you you said um, uh, raised a, a little bit of a flag for me, and I'm just wondering if you can elaborate more. Just about that folks are not having access to healthcare in the way um, that, I know there's healthcare provided in the facility, but there, there are cases like if somebody has cancer and cancer treatment, they might need to go outside the facility and Correct. other, I'm sure there, there are many circumstances like that. So could you, could you tell us a little bit more about that or um, how, because I, I think that's, 
that this, it's a bit problematic. Um, yeah, we, we uh, and I'll, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Henkin has, has got the point on healthcare, but I, I think I'm gonna get this right. Um, you know, there was a point in time where it had really slowed down, um, but also um, when our new contractor came on in July, um, you know, and again, not a small feat coming on in the middle of a pandemic, right? Not, 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 a, not a small feat. There was a fairly significant backlog of requests for medical care, both internally, externally. And we slowly whittled away at that. And so we try to be very careful. Um, it's, it's almost a case by case basis for folks to go out. So, um, and I'll give this example. We, 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 uh, we recently moved an inmate um, for, for a trip to the dentist from one facility to another. And um, it, it's one of these oddball things with the virus where that inmate ended up positive, but the dentist and the dental hygienist were, were not positive. The two transport officers weren't positive. So we're very careful and it's kind of a case to case basis, but we are at a point where if you need medical care, we're gonna get you out, right? So it's not like we shut that down. And um, you know, that, that, um, that's a case by case basis. Deputy Commissioner Hankin, are you are you there? I am here. And I can did I get that right, Judy? By you all did. means, correct me in front of everybody if I didn't, please. No, I think, Judy, I think we're hearing an echo with you, so I don't know if you have a couple of devices open. Mm, well, I just have the one open right now. Okay, it's, better the now. it's better okay. now. And this may be a good transition yeah. time to go into you and talk about the vaccines and everything. Sure. So you could fill in what Commissioner Baker just addressed and then transition. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deputy Commissioner Judy Henkin, and I'll elaborate a little bit on what uh, the commissioner was speaking about. There were a few reasons for a large backlog of medical appointments at, at one time, and some of that has to do with the community. As you know, non-essential care stopped happening at a lot of practices, and people were unable to get they, they were not going to be taking the patients. So we had that going on. Um, we had a new healthcare provider as of July 1. So there was still some adjustment time and they were assessing the backlog and looking at the most urgent cases. And there's also the, the concern with people go out and then they don't want to have to quarantine. They're, we have to have space for the quarantine. Um, so there were a lot of um, issues as far as um, clearing up the backlog, getting the most urgent cases out and making sure they had follow-up care. And that's something that the new contractor Vital Core has been working on. They've reduced the backlog significantly and um, had a real concern for um, care shouldn't be delayed when it's gonna cause further complications. So they have started reviewing those on a regular basis to make sure people get out and they're trying to increase the use of telehealth also where it can be used. Of course, it can't be used for everything, but um, that's another one of their strategies on reducing the backlog. If that answers your question. Um, I, can I can tell you now about the vaccine process. Um, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just wanna make sure that Sarah, did you have anything else, Sarah? I, I had a follow-up question that, that's pretty quick. Um, I remember last, as we were getting the new healthcare provider in, that there were, you were looking for a new medical director um, and just wonder, and I know that there were some challenges in hiring somebody for this, and we, we increased the salary, I think, uh, during um, uh, the joint fiscal um, process. But do you have a, do you have a, a that, is that position filled? Commissioner, do you want to take this? Um, yes, yeah, so we, we, we do have a medical director representative. Um, that's the good news. Bad news is it's part-time. It's 20 hours a week. <clears throat> it's Dr. Scott Strenio, who works in Diva. And um, on, on Medicaid review issues. And um, Dr. Strenio has a very deep background in correctional health care. And so we do have him part-time because we couldn't find somebody. And um, it's, 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 it's meeting our needs for right now. And he was instrumental back in the summer when we had the outbreak in Tallahassee, or Tallahatchie. He actually went down there to make sure that they were following community care standards. 
Thank you. So, Deputy Commissioner, why don't we turn to the vaccines? Sure. Um, as you know, uh, Vermont has chosen a kind of simplified way to move through the population to get vaccines accessible to people. It's made it a little easier for corrections, too. Um, the first round, Vital Core staff, our contractor, um, their nursing staff, and their healthcare providers were getting their vaccines through the community um, at the hospitals. We're now moving into the same stage that the rest of the state is, that, that um, offenders and um, staff age 75 and up are, are eligible for vaccines. Right now, staff, we, I don't believe we have anyone 75 and above as staff, which sort of a surprise because people do make careers out of things. I'm always amazed. But um, we do have several offenders that are in that age group and they're housed in two of our facilities. Unfortunately, the first clinic we were going to have was at Springfield yesterday, and you heard there was a glitch. So it uh, didn't occur, but it is rescheduled for next week. We have 10, um, 10 residents that will be vaccinated, and the vaccine is being administered under the order of Dr. Levine through the health department. Vital Core staff is not doing the clinics for us. And that was determined after some discussions with the health department about what would make sense. And given the quantities, the storage, and how the vaccine has to be handled, this was the alternative that works the best for at least the first several rounds of vaccines. Next week, we also have scheduled, in addition to Springfield, we have several residents in St. Albans facility that will be getting their vaccines, and that will take care of the first round of 75 plus. As you probably also know, that whole process is going to take several weeks to go through. They'll be getting scheduling their second um, vaccines around uh, the 20 something of February. Both of those um, groups will get their second vaccines. And when the state moves to the next age tier, so will corrections. And we do have, I think there'll be 15 people in the next round statewide. And that will be another few weeks. When we get down to the 65 to 69 group, we do have several people that are in Tallahatchie and we're working with that facility to get those folks vaccinated on the same schedule as if they were in Vermont. And um, we're watching that. We have the names of who that is. We're watching how that's going to play out. And our out of state team has been following that for us. Um, other than that, um, I, I think kind of the simplification of this design of the rollout makes it a little easier for us also. When we get into a more generalized, larger population, they may the vaccines may be administered at that time by the vital core staff, and they have agreed to do that. Um, but as of now, that is not decided. So Deputy Commissioner, I have a question. So for the first rounds that are coming out, is someone from the community or someone from the health department going to come into the facility to administer the vaccine? They're having it on the same days as the community vaccines. So for instance, on there's a vaccine in um, St. Albans next Tuesday. When that clinic is closing up at three or whatever, um, nursing staff from that clinic will go to the facility to administer the vaccines. And they're also doing the 15 minute observation. So they'll stay until their vaccines are completed. Okay. Questions? Are inmates having any concerns about the vaccination, about the vaccine at all? Are you getting pushback or are they anxious to get it? Um, it you know, it's interesting to me that the first round, the 75 plus, we had um, nine persons in that first group that were asked and eight of them agreed. And we did have someone who um, needs a guardian to determine to consent. So that was a good, almost 100%. Um, we did have questions and the commissioner may want to address this by staff, but who were still concerned that they were not getting their vaccinations as a essential worker group or first responders would. And that um, there's been questions as to that. So there may be some concerns about seeing other folks um, that are incarcerated getting their vaccinations when they're not. But again, they would be entitled to, as in the community, if there is um, an employee that's 
68 years old, when that age tier is eligible to get vaccinated, at least for now, they'll also be signing up as um, members of the community and they'll be able to get their vaccinations that way. Okay. Questions from the committee? Anything? Okay, Commissioner, where do you want to go next? Well, I, I think um, we can wrap things up with, uh, I'd like Sarah um, to introduce herself. And um, I would say that um, she'll give you a pretty good overview of our logistical operation. I know early on, there was a lot of questions around PPE and supplies and cleaning supplies. And um, we struggled like a lot of folks, but I, I want Sarah to talk about the system that's in place um, that, that she helped develop along with, uh, with Bob Arnell. So Sarah, would you introduce yourself to the committee, please? Hello, and thank you. Yes, I am Sarah Turka. I'm a recruitment and inclusion coordinator for corrections. Additionally, I've been pulled in as part of the COVID response on our logistics section of our incident command. Um, I, like uh, Commissioner articulated, this is a multiple person effort. So additionally, Robert Arnell and Corey Stone are really heading the function of our central logistics. But additionally, we have points of contacts at all of our field and facility sites uh, identified as log chiefs so that we're able to have real time data on as far as uh, needs that each facility or field site might have in relation to PPE. So we really have built a robust logistical operation that's encompassed of planning, sustainment, warehouse operations, and then supply chain visibility. The supply chain visibility is really critical because it allows us to know what our customer base and their needs are, as well as um, what we have at the wholesale level and what we can expect to have. So for instance, it's no uh, mystery that N95s have been in high demand uh, and almost impossible to to gain. And so knowing the, the visibility of the supply chain has been really instrumental in us to be able to have the items that we provide at our facilities to not only protect the uh, staff that are working there, but also the our clients that are being housed in these facilities. Um, what it really breaks down to is a couple core areas. The biggest one that I wanna talk to you guys about is our manufacturing bases. We had to really be innovative and gaining some of the supplies that were not available in the supply chain. So initially any of our requests for supplies goes through the SEOC and BGS procurement, but we have found roadblocks in that process just because the supplies weren't available. So we created our own ways to find those supplies, which was a lot of creativity. Um, for example, we have several manufacturing bases currently. Our Burlington Probation and Parole Office uh, is at the ready to bottle up hand sanitizer that we get from Silo Distillery that we put in our facilities. Uh, Northern State Correctional Facility and Northeast Correctional Complex both have mask operations where they uh, put together microfiber masks and cloth masks that we supply to not only our staff but the inmate population. Uh, we have down operations at Southern State as well as Northern State. Uh, so we are able to provide a lot of the PPE that we see difficulty in getting from mainstream suppliers and in-house so that we always have them. We've also created a dedicated delivery service. So if a, if a facility or field site indicates that they are low in a supply or that they uh, require additional supplies that we um, can immediately uh, activate our transportation network and get those supplies to them. So for example, um, Chittenden Regional that the commissioner had indicated has some positive cases. They already were in what we call the green, which means good with supplies, but we always reach out and get them additional supplies if necessary. And so we were able to activate that transportation network and get those su additional supplies to them. Um, the way that it breaks down is we have a centralized inventory, which is encompassed of a large bulk amount of quantities of PPE, but then we also have a reconstitution, which means if we reach a depot level of stock that we're able to pull from this reconstitution as a pre-planning measure. So we're not in the situation we were last year where we're being reactive, that we're being proactive. Um, and then at our field sites, they all have their own, the facility and field sites all have their own storage level as well. This has been really critical because we're able to anticipate the needs of what people need, uh, do the research around, for instance, I 
talked about the microfiber masks. Uh, not everyone uses those, but we found several articles from the Army that um, indicated that they have a higher filtration rate, which is better to protect our officers and our offender population. And so we create those in-house and that's not something you're going to necessarily see everywhere. Um, additionally, I just wanted to talk about some of the things we had to do with the transportation network. So COVID testing, uh, Commissioner Baker talked about the sequential testing. We have had to supply those um, test kits to the facilities. Uh, from BDH, so our transportation network does that. Additionally, we've started uh, the CIC staff testing, which is CIC Health out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we have uh, a supply network where we order the supplies at the central level, we prepare them, and then we send them out to the field sites so that they're uh, able to do the testing. I don't know if you guys remember way back when uh, UVM network crashed. And so that uh, shut down some of the processes that we had in place for uh, getting our test kits there uh, to be examined appropriately. So we activated our transportation network and on a, I think it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday basis, we were getting those tests from all six of our facilities uh, rapidly to be checked to ensure that no one was positive in our facilities. I think um, outside of that, I wanna really articulate that currently due to the efforts that we've all put together, and this is a really collective effort, we have more than a six month supply if all six of our facilities were to be COVID positive, which is highly impressive to the point that we have several departments reaching out to us about where we get our supplies, which has, like I've indicated before, uh, been done Due to a lot of innovation. So we've gone to places like um, Etsy, eBay, Amazon, because we've hit roadblocks with the SEOC and BGS and them not having the supplies. Not that they haven't been critical in assisting us into the attainment of supplies, but there have been times where we've not been able to get it from them. And I think that is essentially all that I have to share regarding um, our logistical operations just ending. I know that there were some comments around concerns with uh, Mississippi. We also have supplied Mississippi with microfiber masks because that's not something that they typically had in their PPE equipment because not everyone does have that in their um, lineup of supplies. And so on a monthly basis, we send uh, an ample amount of microfiber masks to ensure that our offender population down there have those. So it sounds like a DOC, it's its own little city itself, your own little operation. You can take care of everything. And maybe some folks will tap into you folks to want more PPE and you could produce them. Listen, uh, Madam Chair, just be careful. I don't want Walmart to hear about Sarah because <laughs> they'll be stealing her away from me. Right. You got to keep her. I know there's a question, but I just want to make a comment. Um, I, I had said to the committee early on that I was going to start this year bringing other staff into the committee so you could see the, the caliber of the staff that we have working. And uh, Sarah is a shiny example of the caliber of the staff we have. Uh, the work that she's done with the team, Bob Arnell and, uh, and Corey Stone um, is amazing. And uh, she's being very humble when she describes what's going on. Um, it is an amazing process behind the scenes every single day, making sure that our employees and our inmates are, are safe. So I, I just, I wanted to say that I know there's some questions. Being humble is always great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Michael. Um, yes, just going back to uh, Tallahatchie Commissioner or Deputy Commissioner, whoever wants to answer. Um, I, if I, I, if I apologize if I missed it. Tallahatchie, you said there were, I believe, 180 something total cases. How, how many Vermonters? Did we, did we know that number? Yeah, they, they, they uh, represented. They, they were all our Vermont population that was positive. Oh, so the whole, again, the whole it, population. Yeah. Okay, I well, thought close, maybe I well at the time, at the time, it wasn't uh, our whole population, but it was. It was a good share of our population. I forget the number that was negative, but it was somewhere in the ballpark of 35. Yeah, it was very The small. rest were positive. It was, so we had it was a very plus. serious outbreak, yeah. We're we very fortunate we didn't lose anybody. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we were over 200 at the time when this happened that we had in the out-of-state beds. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen. Yes. 
um, not a question, just a comment of appreciation again. Like it does seem like this is a well-oiled machine and um, just feeling fortunate that we have this team, this work in place and all the staff um, for, for our staff, their families and for the inmates that are there. Um, and I feel like it is something that I'm trying to do with, you know, we're going through these really challenging times and to just reflect and appreciate the kind of silver linings of things and that this is teamwork and um, leadership that we're seeing that hopefully we can hold through through whatever comes next in it. So just thank you for that. You're, you're welcome, Representative. I appreciate those comments. And I wanna reemphasize again, um, this is the team I found when I got the corrections a year ago. And it wasn't long before we were in the fire. I mean, two months into my tenure as the interim, we were in the fire. And it's people like Sarah and the deputy commissioner and Al Cormier that stepped up and um, it's amazing to watch. Uh, I'm just kind of standing on the sidelines. Um, just, you know, it's amazing to watch. These are very talented people, very talented people. That's great, thank you. Thank you. Anything else here? Uh, Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just looking up <clears throat> the GTL uh, tablets and uh, looks like they're, they're, they're fairly expensive for the, for the uh, inmates to use. Um, what happened? Oh, there you are, Commissioner. <laughs> you disappeared on my screen. Um, I was wondering about, especially around vi uh, video visitation, whether um, because inmates can't have uh, physical visit, visit, visitation, whether um, uh, maybe it's an appropriate COVID expense to, to uh, provide some subsidy for the uh, inmates to have video vis visitations. It's because it's uh, two, $2.50 for 10 minutes looks like. Yeah, um, so, so when we shut down visitation, you know, and again, um, I would have to get someone that really understands the technology here that completely go too deep into this, but I'll give you the half inch deep. Um, GTL, um, when systems around the country were shutting down visitation, GTL actually stepped up and provided either discount or free video um, to, to the inmates. Mm -hmm. And then I believe, and I could, this is where I, my memory's a little foggy. I do believe at some point, um, we picked up some of that cost um, because it, it would be unfair uh, to, to the inmates to do that. Now, they still do. Um, if they, and I, I think it's one ten, two 10 minute visits a week or one, if they go over that, they are paying for that. But we were able to work out something with GTL and they were very, very uh, cooperative in this process. Okay, that's great to hear. Thank you. So sometimes you'll find what we can access and pay for on the outside. There are different requirements and different contract structures for within DOC. So you can't always compare apples to oranges. I mean, apples to apples with what we can get as a private citizen versus someone who is incarcerated. Sure, I mean, they're providing these tablets for free and there's no connection charges and all of that. So well, I, just, I say this in general, not just targeting the tablets, but in general, uh, because there's a whole different level of requirements um, dealing with a corrections population than dealing with you and I, or just us as citizens. Right. So I just want to put that out there that it's not always um, apples to apples comparison for that so that you know we don't get hooked into thinking that something that we can do is applicable to someone who's incarcerated and at the same cost for that. Any other questions here? I don't see anything so this would be a good time for us to take a break. Um, you folks to go back to your work. You're doing great jobs. I want to thank you all. We are so fortunate to have you all on board for the department and for the state. I think we have a real success story here. And I remember what Commissioner Baker said to me the first part of March last year when all this was starting to happen. 
and stating, you know, our correctional facilities are just like our cruise ships that are out there. And we get a couple outbreaks and we're in trouble. So hats off to what all of you have been doing because we've been doing a terrific job with our um, incarcerated uh, folks and our staff and your whole department. I wanna thank you. And I'm sure I speak for the committee as a whole when I say that. Thank you, Representative. Thank, we don't, thank you we don't, very much. Yeah, we don't get this work done without support. And uh, it's always, well, I, I, I spend a good part of my life in this committee. So I, I, I appreciate all of your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, I have a quick, go oh, too late. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Oh. Go ahead, Kurt. I didn't see your hand. Was it up? Yep. Hang on uh, one second. I got to turn my oh. picture off. Okay. Uh, this, Go this, ahead, is a quick, this is a question coming way out of left field, but I don't have the opportunity to ask it very often. So, Sorry, um, Colchester does have a jail where the, we, at the police station, where some people are held briefly before they're processed or something. Yes. Is there any relationship between DOC and such local um, jails or? No, the only, the only relationship we would have, Representative, uh, as I understand it, there is legislation, I believe it's legislation, either state or federal. That talks about, so a, lot of, a lot of facilities. Judy, like, Judy a lot could of you uh, mute, please? A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of PDs will have holding cells, what's known as holding cells, like that, right. Representative. And um, if, if it's just a temporary holding, we have no role in that at all. If they're going to house people for long periods of time, in the day, in my day as a young road trooper, um, in Bennington County, for example, the Bennington Police Department had cells where you would, you would hold people um, instead of transporting them to Rutland. And so if that happens, we are the agency that inspects those jails to meet the standards for humanity and dignity and safety and so on. But most police departments that have holding cells, we have nothing to do with those. Okay, good, that's, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's take a quick 10 minute break, folks. Um, good evening, folks. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Judy. <laughs>